fine. Take it away. Well, take it away, all right. Well, first of all, someone said to me, you're going to be on stage with who today? And I thought to myself, do I tell everyone this? You know, do I shout it out? Vinod, it's a total honor being here. And um, as all of you know, if you don't know Vinod Koshla, then shame on you, first of all. Um, there are legends um, that have comprised the fabric of the Silicon Valley and pretty much globally. And I have to say that I always wonder a little bit about your journey here. Some of us know that. And one of the most interesting parts of you and the philosophy that you have, because that is really your core, your philosophies, is around values. You say that, I like my values because they make me feel better. Mm. I wish everybody felt that way. Uh, and then on the other hand, you say to your companies, break all the rules, but maintain your values. Can you talk a little bit about values and your belief system? Uh, happy to. First, hello, everybody. <laughs> I, I, I always love coming to Thai because there's so many entrepreneurs here, and I live the religion of entrepreneurship. So, uh, and, and, and I also know how hard it is being an entrepreneur and how, and I will answer your question too. Uh, don't worry. Uh, but I love entrepreneurs for how, how much they're willing to try. Yes. Uh, I do want to make one comment before I get to your question. Absolutely. Uh, I find the notion of legends, which you mentioned, sort of funny for the following reason. Um, I know lots of people who are smarter than me, who put more effort in than me, but didn't get there. So one of the things to realize, and it's truly a message to all entrepreneurs, you have to do all the right things, and then you have to get lucky. Oh, that's interesting. Right? There we go. You know, I like that. I, I can't tell you how many ways I've been lucky in my life to get here. I've always worked hard. I've always tried to work smart. I've always tried new things, taken a lot of risks. But I know lots of other people who've done the same and not gotten here. And, and so you really have to appreciate what luck does for you. And of all the people, I really understand what luck means. So what uh, does it mean? Because to tell you the truth, I think people make their own luck too. In some ways, there's an old saying that, you know, opportunity doesn't knock. You have to, right, find that opportunity. Yeah. So what is, what is luck? Is it being in the right place at the right time? Is it saying the right thing? Is it seeing things that other people don't see, but you do, and you're maybe a little lucky looking at it from a different perspective? Um, you know, it's a lot of things. And let me just say, uh, we were talking about, I did a presentation on entrepreneurship for the Churchill Club in 1986. Yes, I'm that old. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't feel old. Um, I feel very different. Uh, but. One of the slides in this presentation is on our website. It's called the Entrepreneurial Roller Coaster, where the highs are high yeah. and the lows are low. Yes. And there's a slide on an essential thing entrepreneurs do, which is charm lady luck. Uh, so there's a slide on this that I put together in 1986 because I realized how lucky I am to have things fall the right way. Um, but having said that, uh, I tell many entrepreneurs, give yourself a chance to get lucky. Now, what I mean by that is give yourself more time, try more things. In the parlance of sports, and I'm a hockey fan, uh, a San Jose Sharks hockey fan, I say take more shots on goal. If you take more shots on goal, you're likely to get more lucky. When you're running out of money, if you extend your runway or find a way to hang on by your bare knuckles, and those of you who are real entrepreneurs, you've seen all this and seen the, the low side of the roller coaster. Uh, the longer you go and the more creative you get about trying more things, 
you give yourself a shot on goal, a chance to get lucky. It's an essential part of entrepreneurship that people sometimes don't understand. You can do all the right things and still not succeed. So that actually, that first of all- I do want to go back to your no, original no, 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 question. No, I'm going to go, but I'm going to take this a bit further. Because okay. There are two things. First of all, I love the fact that luck is a lady, but beside that. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but that piece that you wrote, okay, on the roller coaster of an entrepreneur, there are very high highs and definitely, you talk a lot about the dark days and the low lows. And I think this is very important for entrepreneurs, especially all out there. As venture capitalists, I too, we see that it's a struggle. Being an entrepreneur is always glorified, don't you think? And your paper really dug into this in a very thoughtful way. Well, I, look, the press writes about great stories and glorifies entrepreneurship. And it should, because entrepreneurs change the world. Yeah. Uh, and we can talk about it later, but no large business innovation, societally impactful innovation uh, has, as far as I can tell, come out of a big company. People you'd expect to do it. I, I should more accurately, almost all, or most of the large innovations that have affected society. And I'm not talking about research or R&D. Okay. Uh, has come from entrepreneurs. Uh, so I think entrepreneurship is very important. It should be glorified. But if you are an entrepreneur, you ha you're more likely to fail than succeed, right? That's true, most comp startup companies fail, they don't succeed. And even the ones that do succeed, near fail so many times. Uh, you know, at Sun, we almost ran out of money multiple times because there was, one tech, there was one technical problem that kept us from shipping for 60 or 90 days, and we were barely hanging on. Really? Uh, the latest, uh, the earliest I left the office, those 90 days was like 3 a.m. Uh, and I'd be back there by 6 a.m. Um, so you go through that. If you read the story of Tesla, it, it almost drove Elon Musk bankrupt. Now, today that sounds like a great story. I'll bet you he didn't feel great back then. <laughs> Undoubtedly. And those of you who are entrepreneurs appreciate that. That's why I call entrepreneurship a roller coaster where the highs are high, but the lows are stomach churning, hard, painful. Depressing, right? Depressing, all those things. And my advice to you entrepreneurs is when that happens, find ways to hang on. Find ways to ask intelligent questions of what haven't you tried what haven't you, what have you assumed that's not true that can change the trajectory? Right. Because you right? think- Question your assumptions from- And you, because you think there is no such thing as impossible. I, I think entrepreneurship is about imagining the impossible. Right. Or, um, um, uh, you know, so look, if something was normally doable, or most people thought was doable, people would do it. Somebody would already have done it. So you start with, I always say, what I love about entrepreneurs is they imagine the possible, and sometimes the impossible, and they take the impossible, they turn it into possible, then maybe it just becomes improbable, but possible, and then you go from improbable to probable, to then making it happen. This is the journey of entrepreneurship, and this is why failure rates are so high, and it can be so, so stomach churning to ride this roller coaster. But this is why I admire entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs who are religious about their mission, yes. what they're trying to get done, and they stick with it, they want this thing to happen in the world. And it's just beautiful to watch, and I get a lot of reward out of helping mentor those entrepreneurs. So I only work, and I probably easily still work 80 hours a week. It's unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. Oh yeah, I, I easily work 80 hours a week. Right, I feel uh, so insufficient. 
<laughs> uh, it's to help entrepreneurs succeed. Right. And, and frankly, we were talking about this backstage. You know, just like I push my kids to succeed, I don't want their life to be comfortable. I want it to be achievement oriented. I want to be their friend, but more than that, I want them to push them to succeed, put more effort in, strive right. more, right. try more things. Right. Uh, that's how I look at entrepreneurs too. Right. And I consider it my job to push. So whenever I see other board members or others being polite and I call it hypocritically polite. I think they're doing the entrepreneurs a disservice if they're not pushing them with hard questions. Yes, yes. I actually, you, you touch about something. You know, I touched on a lot well, of things. Yeah. Sorry I, I, about I'm it. pulling from there here. Um, so there's one thing that you do talk a lot about, which is that you do push the entrepreneurs to succeed. And we, we all try and we want them to succeed. But if they fail, that's just as important. And you, talk, you speak a lot about this, and, uh, and it's probably the most important part in terms of the learning curve. So when I see an entrepreneur and we, we, we meet them, we talk to them first about their failure. We want to know how they failed, what they did with that, how they applied those lessons. And then speaking with you, that's an integral part, don't you think? Um, and I've heard you say this not time and again, people need to fail. You always say, people need to fail. Yeah. And you failed, right? Yeah. Um, have you failed? I have failed many times. Okay, okay. Uh, let, me, let me ask this question. Everybody knows I started, or most people know I started Sun. How many people kn know a company, I, me and Scott McNeely, both of us started Sun, started around the same time, not far from where we are sitting? Anybody know the name? What's it called? SGI. Nope. No, nope, but nope. we had it back here. Uh, no, I heard Daisy. Daisy was a successful company I started before I started Sun. Right, right. And went on to do an IPO and was very successful. There was a small company called the Data Dump that I started. Right. With McNeely, both of us did together. But nobody remembers. And I like to use that as proof that failures are not important. Only successes happen and large successes. Now the difference is the following. Most people avoid risk so much in their life, they fail to try things. When I say I'd rather try and fail than fail to try. And most people who are not entrepreneurs, and that's most of the people, they don't try things and they don't take risks. If you don't take risks, if there's no risk involved, there's nothing new involved. It just goes by definition. Right. So to me, failure to take risk is failure to try anything new. And if you're afraid of your failures, you're not gonna try new things, you're never gonna innovate, you might get lucky, and there's people who yeah. do get lucky, and there's exceptions to all these rules, but uh, there's a Harvard Business School case that, say, that sort of starts with a quote from me that says, my willingness to fail is what gives me the ability to succeed. I like that. My willingness to fail, because otherwise I wouldn't have tried all these things. I'd have gotten a job at McKinsey out of Stanford Business School. I didn't do that. I know how you don't think, you, have, you don't like consultants and people in that, right? I, I don't like pundits and punditry. Okay. I like doers, people who do things themselves. Right. right. So you like advisors, experience. consultants, uh, professors, pontificators, uh, it's easy to pontificate. It's easy to advise. It's hard, as entrepreneurs know, to actually do stuff. Right. And so I like doers, not pontificators. You must have been a heck of a student. You, you must have given your teachers a run for their money, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, very few teachers wanted me as a student. Yes, I, <laughs> and yet the ones that had you as a student are probably saying, oh, Vinod Koshla, he was one of my students, so we can all But look, run. It, uh, uh, this is an attitude you have at any age. 
It doesn't matter you whether you're 16 or 65. I'm 62. Yeah? Um, and, and there's sort of sometimes the court is saying old people uh, don't have new ideas. It's not age, it's a mental attitude about how you think about yourself, right? Yes. Um, it's, it's funny, I'll come back to the example. Most people think at 62, and I went to my business school reunion, and everybody is retiring, and I said, hmm, I'm as far from retiring, in my view, health permitting, as my dad was when he was 33. My dad retired, he was in the Indian Army, he retired at age 53, which was mandatory. At my age, I feel like I'm further from retirement than he was at age 33, so I'm, I'm, I'm relatively young in retirement terms. Yeah. <laughs> I like to say you grow old when you retire, not when you, yeah. you don't retire when you grow old. But back to this issue, since many people here are from IIT, when I started at IIT, I was 16. There wasn't a single programming class, computer programming class at any IIT in India. So me and three other guys, we started the first programming club. It was a hobby club when we started a programming class at age 16. If something doesn't exist, you create it. Then I got interested in biomedical engineering, which had nothing to do with the electrical engineering I was doing. And we started a biomedical engineering pro program with one professor called Professor Gua. So you can always create, in, even in a seemingly impossible world, whatever you want to make happen if you try enough. And that's the message I want to leave people with. So I feel like I helped start the first programming class at NEIT. I helped start the first uh, biomedical engineering program at NEIIT. Uh, I tried to start a soy milk company in India when I was in college. That failed, didn't get off the ground, mostly because they told me it takes seven years to get a phone line uh, to start my business. And I wanted to start it because I used to waste time every day going to the milkman while he milked the cow to get milk. That was sort of life up. every day. Right. And so, heck, I said, why not start soy milk, which doesn't need, which doesn't need refrigeration and can or a hang cow. it out. Right. So uh, let me give you one more piece of advice that I think I'm going off topic, but okay. hey, I like to talk. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize that. Most people I know are limited by what they think they can do, not by what they can actually do. So whenever you get into the, ah, oh, that won't work, but why not try it? You do a lot more. And if you naively believe you can do a lot more, then you will actually do a lot more. And so naivete is an important part of entrepreneurship. Right, right. And, and, and sort of, I love naive people going out trying to change the world because they're not limited by how they're thinking. Back to this age issue, right. age isn't the problem in innovation. Too much experience in an area you're trying to innovate in is the problem. Really? Right? The more experience you have, the more wisdom you have about everything that can be done and can't be done, so you don't challenge that conventional wisdom, so you repeat what others have done. It's so it's not about age, it's about how you think and how much experience you have. So if I'm starting a healthcare company today, so we were recently recruiting for CEO for a healthcare company, I told the recruiter, I won't meet any candidate who's ever worked in healthcare before for this job. Now that's very counterintuitive, but it is so essential to innovation. Let me put it this way. I was talking about large innovations and big companies. You'd think the traditional companies would innovate, but did Boeing and Lockheed innovate space or did uh, SpaceX do that? 
Why? Because Boeing and Lockheed knew too much about how space launches are done. General Motors worked for decades on electric vehicles and produced a dud called the EV1 with billions of dollars. Tesla innovated. What? NBC and CBS and others didn't innovate media. Twitter and Facebook and YouTube did. What? Uh, um, pharmaceutical companies didn't innovate biotechnology. Genentech, which was and Genentech founder Bob Swanson was an associate at Kleiner Perkins yes. when he started Genentech, right? right? Um, M uh, Walmart didn't change retail, Amazon. So hard pressed to think of a major innovation that came out of and established a new paradigm. And there's lots of incremental innovation examples at the big companies, but very few where they established a new paradigm. If you think about something that is true, email me. Uh, but the uh, closest thing I could think of is because Bank of America was issuing credit in the early 70s, they issued the credit card. And that was about the most radical innovation out of a big company I could come up with that changed the way people operate. Right, right. Well, Isn't I that surprising? And that should be the good news for all of you. And don't rely on those big corporate partnerships or think Cisco or somebody else can do something for you. Entrepreneurs innovate and they think from scratch and are not constrained by uh, the conventional wisdom in the space they're innovating in. Sorry, well, let's go back to no, your no, question on no, values. No, no, forget about that. Value, what question on value? So let's pick up on one thing, uh, one thing. Hiring, you may, I've heard you say this, is that when you look, you spend a lot of time hiring, identifying talent for your companies, for your founders, probably more so than most VCs, and, but you talk about the talent is the key. Not necessarily the product, but the talent, and that's why you spend so much time. And it's a, and it's a broad scope of talent. So as you're saying, you're not gonna hire someone for the healthcare, necessarily for healthcare. You're looking for different types of characteristics. So I'd like for you to just expand a bit on that in terms of why you spend so much time on hiring and really what you're looking for because that's a very big pain point for entrepreneurs is how do you get the right team? How do you know at the very beginning this is the right person for this slot? And what happens if it's not, which happens all the time? So my last meeting before coming here was about the management team for a company and saying, what do you look for in these three positions you're looking for? Perfect. That was the entire meeting. Perfect. Right? How do we do a spec for what you're looking for? Yes. And sort of uh, a very unusual approach to it. This company was hiring a VP of sales for healthcare and I said, don't look in healthcare right. for a, a VP. I'm okay if you hire somebody who's sold into healthcare for one or two years, but if he spent more than that, you're gonna get the wrong person. Right. Right? Uh, Did they push back on that? No, no? they, they okay. actually completely agreed. Okay. And they asked a reasonable question. If you get a VP from healthcare, right. we'll have a faster start, we'll have more revenue the next six months. Right. And I immediately said, I'd rather worry about the next three years than the and have you missed the next six months while this person's coming up to speed. That's right? Those are the kinds of trade-offs everyday entrepreneurs make. Right. But, you know, I have a tweet, some of you follow me on Twitter, um, called a company becomes the people it hires, not the business plan it makes. Business plans are mostly irrelevant they help me understand the quality of thinking of an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but not what they'll actually do. Right. The team they build okay. helps me judge where are they gonna go. Interesting, interesting. And so, almost certainly, the people you hire will determine the company you become. Uh, and one of my other favorite quotes is there's a massive difference between a zero million dollar startup and a zero billion dollar startup 
and it's all about culture and attitude and how you think about the problem and how you think about the team you're gonna build. Mm -hmm. The single biggest reason I reject companies that we don't wanna invest in, uh, and frankly, just in this YC batch, there was three companies I said, I, I would love to invest if you're going to look for a co-founder like X, Y, or Z. Right. And if you just agreed to do that and set founder equity aside to hire that person, right. I'd invest. But if you don't think that's important, then I think you'll become a different kind of company. How many of them? Once in a while, I'd say 30% of the companies figured this out. Right. And one did. Right. And two didn't. There were three I made this proposition to in this batch. And only one out of the three took you up on this? Mm -hmm. so well, they hedged, but it was clear to me they weren't serious. Right. Because when I said, so you'll, will you give them equal equity to what you have? Right. And they'd hedge, and then I knew they would never do it. That's unbelievable. What, it, I, so it's really important. Isn't that a certain arrogance, though? I mean, how do you really talk to well, an entrepreneur I, that says, you know, I've had a wee bit more experience than you have. I know that you don't look, sit on it's, boards. Uh, because it's, don't... it's important to realize the following, and this is true of all entrepreneurs. When you're working on a startup and I'm advising you, you're spending 80 hours a week yes. on your startup. Yes. I'm spending occasional meetings with you you're going to know a lot more about your business than I ever will. This is why I religiously believe board members should never ever board on anything. And now I don't even go on boards because board members want to <laughs> vote on things. Now, the flip side of it is I want you to listen to me and evaluate what I'm saying in the context of all the nuance you understand about your business. My job is to push you, challenge you, make you think about aspects you don't understand, experience I've had, because my big advantage over you as an entrepreneur, I've screwed up in more ways than anybody in this room by a lot, right? Because I've invested in things that have failed more often than anybody here, right? right? So I have a lot of experience I want to present failure modes to you, but then you have to evaluate it in your context. So I can proudly say, uh, and there's one exception, we can talk about it if we have time, I know we are running out of time. In 30 years, I've never once, once voted against a management team on any issue, including massive issues like should we sell the company or not. I'll say I disagree, but I'll, Vote with you. And, and I hate boards that vote on things. And so I've stopped going to board meetings. Really? That's actually, that is so antithetical to how we all write work. And I actually, I think this is a good point for all the entrepreneurs, is that it's good to push back. You know, the boards want you to push back. And I'm hoping that more people do that. And then on the other hand, you want VCs not to also stroke at the entrepreneur either. You want them to be fierce, correct? You yep. want them to get the best out so of you. you want VCs, right? first, you shouldn't get on a board because you joined a VC firm and they invested. Right. Right? I always, and sometimes some of the young people in my firm say, hey, can I get on that board? This other firm has this person, and I say, always ask the young people in our firm who want to be independent board members, what have you done to earn the right to advise an entrepreneur? Yes. Prove to me you have the qualifications to advise an entrepreneur before I let you do it independently. Experience, they need experience, yeah. right? Uh, so that's really important, but the flip side of the advice, I spend more time talking to entrepreneurs on why to ignore their boards listen to them, extract their experience if they have relevant experience, but then to make their own decisions and push back. Right. And I've gone to many a board meeting where I'm not on the board to talk about why the entrepreneur is right, 
or why the board should let the entrepreneur pick this strategy or this burn rate or this acquisition or even if you see the entrepreneur going in the wrong and you see them heading towards a slippery slope look my job is to push them hard when i see that happening right all right and i prefer brutal honesty to hypocritical politeness <laughs> and most board members are hypocritically polite to entrepreneurs don't tell them what they sh might be doing wrong uh, that's why i have a reputation for being more direct more blunt saying things to entrepreneurs much more directly like you are screwing up and here's why and here's what you can do about it and i won't complain about things you can't do anything about but i will push you just like i will push my kids but the flip side of it is encouraging entrepreneurs to make their own decisions because they know so much more about their business and their limitations and their team right right well that i mean that makes sense i think that it's a it's a very it's tough love on one hand yeah it is right? tough love right and anybody who just wants to be your friend is doing you a disservice as an entrepreneur but completely okay now since we don't have as much time i'm going to go right back to your values because i'm not letting you off the hook on this one um because it's such a core piece of who you are your mission driven right your values are your internal compass i think there's a deficit in this world for in values a belief system um and i want to hear that yeah so one of the things i notice a lot is very few people have an internal compass an internal belief system that they stick by through good times and bad times i run into a lot of fortune 500 ceos the number of those ceos who determine their strategy based on what some analyst or some reporter some english major who can't possibly understand the business is writing and they pay attention to it instead of saying what do i believe and i'm going to make that happen right. right that value system is very important it's very important to stick with it no matter what happens it's the compass that guides you and it has to be internal it's not what your neighbors expect not what your friends expect um you know when i was leaving kleiner many people said to me uh, you know you and john are doing so well that was in 2003 2004 uh, why would you leave and i said hey i want to try these science experiments i want to do and what people expect shouldn't drive what you do what your gut is telling you you want to do what makes you happy is what you should do if what made me happy was sitting on a beach somewhere that's what i'd be doing it's just not that interesting right um i love working with young companies and uh, uh, and making helping make interesting things happen yeah right so value systems and belief systems are really important and in internal drivers not expectations of others around you but as friends status society titles right. that shouldn't be driving you right. and the mission and and the mission well uh, mission driven yeah i happen to care a lot about mission and we'll come back to that why i care about mission but you sort of have to have this value system and then bulldoze your way through life uh because that's what entrepreneurs have to do because the decks and walls are stacked against them right now you have to break all the rules and we've talked about that but again when you break rules and most startups can't get where they're going without breaking the rules when you do that you also have to say what are your values and are you breaking your values too so there's been uh, some press around ethics of silicon valley i don't think it's the general rule i i love uh, facebook for example 
their motto is break things. But they, it's really very clear they have a great value system. You look at the people, senior people who've left Facebook, they're working on really interesting topics like basic income and helping government or societally impactful things. That's what Mark and Priscilla are doing with their wealth. Uh, it's very clear that breaking rules doesn't mean uh, being breaking their value system. Right. Those are different things, and you have to stay consistent. Right. Um, and, but that's also, values are inherent in everyone. And uh, the fact is, is that can you uh, create something that defines your values, aligns with your values, and then represents your values? And that goes back to the, also the mission. Because if you don't have a mission, does, yeah. isn't the mission and the value one, you know, two well, to have so the same I think values and mission are different things. Okay. Uh, you can have your mission as building the best golf clubs. Oh. I don't play golf. Right. I don't know why people do. It takes up <laughs> too much time. Uh, but... I don't question somebody who loves golf okay. or wants to build the best, best golf clubs. Okay. But to me, that's not a mission-driven startup. Okay. It's an internally driven startup. It can be driven by the person's values, right. like don't do unethical things or be transparent. Right. Right? Uh, so to me, mission is a completely separate thing. I know people... Like in our fund, we won't invest in anything that's societally negative. Right. So if you have a great gambling startup, we won't do it. If you're extracting oil sands or tar sands, cheaper oil from tar sands, cheaper, we won't do it no matter how profitable it is. Um, now, we'll do neutral things. Right. I personally like to work on things that have positive impact. And the larger the positive impact, the more likely I am to spend more time on it. Yes. That motivates me. Yes. But let me, let me be really honest about it. Uh, ha having this mission is in some sense an indulgence I have. I mean, I can do it. I can work on missionary things and ignore something that might make me more money because I don't worry about do I pay my, how I pay for my kid's college or do I pay my mortgage. I don't have to worry. So I have the luxury, right. and I could take that luxury and work on, on a mission right. or work on making more money or something else. Uh, you know, again, I'm lucky enough, and I think luck has played a massive role in my life. Uh, to indulge myself in things that make me feel good. If I'm having impact, I just feel good. Now, some people may feel good by taking more cocaine. This is my cocaine. Right. <laughs> right? Right. Well, it... it, 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 it I, I, I really think of, and I suspect some of you are sitting here saying, we'd love to work on mission-oriented things, but I've got to pay my kids' tuition. And I recognize that, and that's why I say uh, there are some people who do that anyway, right. but I don't judge people who are not working on missionary things. I feel like I've been lucky enough to get myself in a position where one, I can afford to work on impactful things, and right. two, uh, I actually enjoy it. Yes. Well, it seems that what you enjoy... I do judge people who get lost on cocaine, but... Uh, right. Good uh, to know. I am no judgmental. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's... Actually, we all, are, we all are a bit judgmental. We don't like to say that, but we are. The human nature, right? It's human nature. Yeah. Um, so one, one last, because I know we're running out of time here, but um, you said something to me I found very profound. We were talking about... The, about innovation. We talk about the role of innovation in society. And you said, and perhaps I'm going to get this wrong, but you said 700 million people, do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Are rich in energy, education, healthcare, housing. Do you want to continue on that thought? Yeah. Look, my general view, and this is why entrepreneurship and especially technology entrepreneurship is so important. I talked about most large 
technology innovation on its uh, societally impactful innovation has come from startups. I view the world's problem globally as the following. There may be 700 million people who rich, live a rich lifestyle. And by rich, I mean rich in resources, rich in housing, rich in education, rich in healthcare, and rich in energy. If 7 billion people want it, can we have 10 times the amount of oil, 10 times the amount of healthcare, 10 times the amount of en uh, energy or education? It's not possible to scale the normal way and get everybody to this level of care, right. of, uh, and, uh, of rich lifestyle. But everybody deserves that chance. The only way to get from A to B is by multiplying resources, and only technology can multiply resources. Right? If you had to scale by 10x the number of PhDs or radiologists, you couldn't do it the normal way. You'd have to come up with clever technology resource multipliers, and that's why technology entrepreneurship is so important. That's why I consider it so exciting to work on, why it's way more exciting than sitting on a beach, why I'd rather spend three hours working on this than watching a movie, and I mean that, uh, this is what makes life both challenging and fun, and recognizing that this is hard. I like to encourage groups of entrepreneurs to go do this. Uh, I, I do want to say a couple of things, uh, because entrepreneurship, as I've said again, I keep coming back to this theme. I love encouraging people to be entrepreneurs especially things that multiply resources so the whole world can have it. You know, cell phones, when I was starting my soy, soy milk startup in India, it took seven years to get a phone line because it was a landline and infrastructure heavy. And then cell phones came along and really made it accessible. For those of you who work on that, I've encouraged you to try new things, take large risks, and failure is okay. I do want to say failure is sometimes glorified too much. You don't want to fail, but you should be willing to take risks, and that might involve failure. And there is things called intelligent failure and dumb failure. Right? When you take intelligent risks, you take risks where if they succeed, uh, you'll be successful as a company or on your mission. If they fail, you don't want them to kill you. Right? So asymmetric risks, where the payoff is much larger than the loss, yet the loss in your company is sustainable. I was in a board meeting, and we were trying to decide whether to raise an extra $30 million because we, that was available in our financing. And I said, I'd be all for it if you agreed to waste the 30 million you raised, and I use this language just to shock other board members, sure. but in the waste in the following way. Run 10 $3 million experiments, where if you lost, you lost $3 million, and if you won, it doubled your market cap. So these were all not projects, but experiments, where, and, and that's a way to think about it, whether you have 100 million in the bank or 100,000. If you have 100,000 in the bank, take 10,000 of it, because losing it won't kill your company, and run 10 experiments of $5,000, $2,000 experiments. So that's how I think of failure and asymmetric reward-based failure. For those of you interested in this topic, there's a great book by Nassim Taleb, not the black swan, but called Anti-Fragility, about this idea that you want to fail in ways that make you stronger and gives you asymmetric upside. 
I just want to leave on that note because, again, I worry about failure being too glorified, yet it, taking risks is so essential to building innova innovation and innovative companies. I think that you have left us all with a tremendous amount to think about. I'm thinking about luck as a part of this. I'm thinking about failure a different way. I'm thinking that they now know, if you haven't realized before, you have to bulldoze your way through this. And you and persistence applied and confidence and the ability to think outside the box, so to speak. Um, I think that this is all, I'm sure everybody's taking home a lot of richness from this. And, and for all those entrepreneurs, let me finish with two of my favorite all-time quotes. Go for it. One was by George Bernard Shaw, who said, reasonable people adapt themselves to the world. Unreasonable people try and adapt the world to themselves. Hence, human progress depends on unreasonable people. I love that. Right? The other was by none other than Martin Luther King, who said, human prog societal progress depends on the socially maladjusted. <laughs> and most entrepreneurs are socially maladjusted. And that's a virtue, not a problem. Don't let the world push you back into conformity. Thank you all very much. I love that. Thanks.